Hey, so welcome to this afternoon's session. And if anybody's still coming in, please do come in and sit down. As usual, in any such setting, there are lots of seats up front. So please do migrate forward. There are really a lot of empty seats up front, and I can see it being a little crowded in the back. Anyway, I am Frances Hellman. I'm uh, the Dean of Mathematical and Physical Sciences here at UC Berkeley. And it's a great pleasure to start this afternoon's session off. So I'm going to give very brief introductions to each of this afternoon's speakers. Um, and let them lead, lead, the, lead the charge forward into, into the wonderful materials they're going to be talking about. So the first speaker is going to be Robert Langer. Uh, he, Robert Langer is a bioengineer and an inventor at MIT, where he is an institute professor. Um, he has a remarkable scope of work. He is one of, of very few individuals that have been elected to the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Sciences, and the National Academy of Inventors. His H index of 261 is truly extraordinary. Anybody who knows anything about H indexes will recognize um, that that is a number that is, I think, unprecedented. It's the highest of any engineer in history. He's been issued 1350 uh, patents worldwide. He won the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences in 2014 for his work leading to the development of controlled drug release systems and new biomaterials. And today he's going to be telling us about biomaterials and how they will change our lives. So, thank you. So, thank you. You did, you did great. Thank you very much. It's really an honor to speak to you. And, and for me, it was a tremendous honor being an engineer to receive the Breakthrough Prize with such outstanding you know, basic scientists in biology and, and physics and math. So I thought I'd start out and tell you a little bit about how we got into this and, and then some futuristic things. Uh, so like I say, I, I, I'm a chemical engineer actually, but when I got done with my degree in 1974, pretty much all my friends went into the oil industry. 
Uh, but I didn't, wasn't excited about that, and I ended up going to Children's Hospital and working with the surgeon, Judah Folkman, and I was the only engineer in the hospital. And the problem that he asked me to work on was could we isolate what would become the first substances that would stop blood vessels from growing? One of the keys to that is developing a, what we call a bioassay, and the bioassay we wanted to use is shown here. It's basically a, a, you have a, a tumor, and this is the eye of a rabbit, and a, we wanted to have a slow-release polymer that could deliver over a two-month period because it took a while for the vessels to grow any of the substances we isolated, and they were all big molecules. So we needed a polymer that was inert in the eye and that could release these large molecules for months. Now, the only problem was the literature and everybody we talked to said you couldn't do this. Let me just, uh, if we could, yeah. The, the literature said the use of, slow, of polymer matrices for slow-release systems was virtually restricted to small molecules. Now, the only thing I kind of had going for me is, is I hadn't read that. <laughs> so I tried anyhow, and I spent actually several years in the laboratory experimenting kind of Edisodian-like, and I actually found over 200 different ways to get this to not work. But eventually, I was able to make these little microspheres and here's one cut in half, and we published in Nature that you could use this to release molecules of virtually any size. But this is now the 1970s, and I was trying, doing this bio work, and I was a postdoc, and I, 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 and I was trying to get some grant money, and so I wrote money, grants to the NIH, but my first nine grants got rejected, and they weren't very excited about engineers doing um, health-related research. So also, I love being a postdoc, but a lot of my friends said it's not good to be a postdoc your whole life. So I, I started applying to chemical engineering departments, and I applied to ones all over the world, and actually not a single one would hire me. They also weren't very excited about bio-research. So I ended up getting a job in the nutrition department, um, but, the, the, but the guy who hired me, he, he was kind of a benevolent dictator, and he didn't, like, he liked me, but he never bothered to ask the rest of the faculty what they thought. So, and that would have actually still been okay, but what happened is, is, uh, he, about a year after I came, he left the department, so the senior faculty told me, well, I should probably leave too. And actually, one of your colleagues, one of my really good friends is Mike Marletta, and he was giving a talk a couple years ago about uh, this, and I'll just uh, read you what he said. He said, one evening he went to a faculty dinner at a Chinese restaurant with me and some senior MIT professors. He said, a senior scientist said, quizzing us while smoking a cigar, he said, when he heard my concepts for polymeric drug delivery, he blew a cloud of smoke in my face and said, you better start looking for another job. And Mike said he thought he was in a Fellini movie. But anyhow, I, I, I kind of kept at it, and like I say, the essay we wanted to do was this, and we actually published a paper in Science in 1976, actually showing for the first time that you could isolate these angiogenesis inhibitors and providing an assay for it. It actually took another 28 years from this paper before the first angiogenesis inhibitors would be approved. In fact, the first one was by Napoleon Ferrara at Genentech who won this prize. But now they're very widely used drugs all over the world. Some of them are the best-selling drugs in history, and they're used not only for cancer, but also for eye diseases like macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy. And the drug delivery systems we did as well are, are widely used by maybe over 100 million patients every year. This is just some pictures of them, different microspheres you inject underneath the skin to deliver drugs for a long time. And you have to do this because otherwise the drugs are rapidly destroyed. So, so that's kind of how I got started, but you know, to, to move into some of the things I wanted to go over today, when, since I was at the hospital and I was working with materials, I was curious, how did materials find their way into medicine? And what was shocking to me when I looked into this is almost always it was a medical doctor who was driving this work, and what they'd almost always do is take a material from their house and use it uh, in medicine. So if you look at this, the artificial heart, for example, as I found, was made out of a lady's girdle because it had a good flex life. And the breast implant was like a mattress stuffing because it was squishy. And I just thought we could do better. You know, I thought we could use chemical engineering design to, to make things from scratch. And so we picked a number of examples, and I'll show you a few. Um, when we started, the only material, um, if we could just, the only material that was uh, FDA approved dissolved, it, it started out looking like this, and then it got spongy, and then it, fall, it fell apart. And so we started using, uh, thinking about what, what do you really want in a polymer? 
And we said, well, we really like it to dissolve like a bar of soap, because then it couldn't dump out the drug. And we actually went through, and I, I won't go through this just in the interest of time, but a whole set of chemical analyses about what type of polymer might work well. Uh, we chose this copolymer, which I'll show you here. And, and then we started collaborating with people using it to do local delivery to treat cancer, in particular brain cancer. But when we wrote grants, pretty much every year we'd write them, they'd get rejected. And because um, people said, well, you couldn't synthesize them, they'll react, uh, they'll react with whatever drug you put in. And the polymers are fragile. So every year we'd get a different objection. That was actually one of the reasons I started writing patents, because the companies didn't care about all the reasons they wouldn't, this wouldn't work. So at any rate, uh, that kept going on and on until 1996 when the FDA approved it. And this is just a picture of one of the systems. It's a little wafer going in the brain. And this got approved in uh, 1996. And it's been used now for the last, it's, it's the treated is the, um, you see the treated in the controls, and it's now been used in over 30 countries for the last uh, 22 years. And, and, and it provided this idea that you could do local delivery to a site. And so one of the other things that people began doing is, is one of my students, Elazar Edelman, is, well, there's these things called stents. These are uh, Chinese finger puzzles. They look like this. But you may know that 50% of the time when you put them in the body, they cause smooth muscle cell prolifer proliferation. <clears throat> so basically, what's now done is exactly the same thing. You take another anti-cancer drug, Taxol, coat it with a polymer on the stent, and it locally delivers a drug. And, and million, you know, over a million of these are used every year. <clears throat> and, and we kept thinking about other things that might be useful for the future. So one area that I also saw at the hospital was minimally invasive surgery. Years ago, if you had a gallbladder operation, what they do is they'd operate on you, they'd take the gallbladder out, you would be incapacitated for a, a month in the hospital. But now, what they do is they make a little incision and they pull the gallbladder out through this minimally invasive surgery. They're out of the hospital in less than a day. So I started thinking, you know, gee, if you could take objects out of the body through these little holes, maybe we could put them in like medical devices. And so I started thinking maybe we could create what are called shape memory materials. Materials that could start out looking like a string so that they would go through this little hole, but then when they get in the body, we could either have a temperature change or a light change, and they'll change shape. And again, this can be done by creating, uh, for the polymer chemists in the audience, multi-block copolymers with switching segments. I'll just show you an example. So what I'm going to do is show you a string at room temperature air, and we're going to drop it into body temperature water, and I hope it changes into a coil, sort of mimicking this stem. So let me try this. Can we turn the video on? Can you turn the video on? Yeah, here's the string. And then as soon as it went into the water, which is a higher temperature, it changed shape. Another thought we had is, you know, let's say you wanted to tie a suture in the body. Uh, like, and if it's in the outside of the body, it's pretty easy if you have a wound. Like, I could do it. You wouldn't want me to do it, but I could do it. <laughs> but inside the body, how could you do it? We thought, well, maybe we could even make the sutures tie themselves. So just as an idea, you could make a loose knot, loop it in maybe in the stomach or some other place. But then when it changes the temperature, you shine a light like with fiber optic, it'll just tighten. So let me show you a second video. Can we turn on that video? So here's this, look at the, you can see the uh, loose knot. Now it's going to tighten as soon as it gets into the water. So, so those are some examples. And then another whole area we started thinking about is could we combine cells and materials? This we did with Jay Vacanti, one of my friends, to make new tissues or organs. Th this is from a, oh, I'm sorry, before we do that, I'm going to just show you one other idea, nanotechnology. Could we, we make nanoparticles? Nanoparticle of uh, this, can we, drug. Could we make nanoparticles that could target to tumors or use them to deliver things like, well, when we thought about this, it was for tumors now. Of course, a lot of people are using it for RNA, and we've been very involved in that ourselves. And of course, you heard about RNA a lot, and you'll hear more about it. But just to show you this video, I, I, I feel like I don't explain it this well, but Nova, the TV show, they came to our lab, and they filmed it, and they do a much better job than me. So I thought I'd show you the video they made. Here it is. He starts with a nanoparticle of anti-cancer drug. That gets encased in a plastic that releases the drug over time, that in turn gets a special wrapping that disguises the package as a water molecule to fool the body's immune system. And last but not least, 
the address where it should be delivered, a key that will only fit the lock of cancer cells. I, I should point out that a lot of the clinicians I work with tell me it doesn't blow the cell up quite like that. But you people are now using lipid nanoparticles and polymer nanoparticles for all kinds of things. In fact, another RNA therapy uh, with l -nylum, that's a company I, I do a lot with, uh, just got approved earlier this year for another rare disease, ATTR, amyloidosis, and Moderna, another company I've been very involved with. They are in 10 clinical trials for delivering messenger RNA for treating different diseases. At any rate, the, and what are some other things where materials might help in the future? So here. Jay Vacanti and I, he's a surgeon at Mass General, had this idea that maybe you could take cells, combine them with materials, and grow them in a bioreactor and make literally virtually any tissue. Um, this was a paper we published in Science. It's been cited about 7,000 times. And uh, just to show you a few examples of what's been done, uh, here's cartilage. And here is a study where uh, you put cartilage in nude animals, and you can redo this guy's skull. And you can redo this guy's cheek. If you open the animal up and look at it, it's pure white glistening cartilage. And histologically, it looks like cartilage. By the way, it's not perfect cartilage. It's not strong enough if anybody's a runner. But you can use it for cosmetic purposes. So the Army came to see Jay and myself and Linda Griffith, who was one of my postdocs, at, and actually is a Berkeley graduate. And uh, they, they'd see patients who didn't have ears or things like that. So they said, could we help make new ears and other body parts? So actually, Linda made a, uh, could we get to go to the next slide? Thanks. So here you see uh, an ear on the left side. And this is a high-powered scanning electron micrograph. These polymers, we make them biodegradable over time. But you can see the cells proliferating in extracellular matrix. Ultimately, the polymer will fully dissolve. And, uh, and, and, and then you um, will get the ear. And in fact, uh, they, they put this on uh, rabbits. And uh, it's actually even been put on humans, if we can uh, go to the next slide. This doesn't seem to be working that well. Uh, so yeah, so, so basically, here's a little boy. He's 12 years old. And like other 12-year-olds, he likes to play baseball. But if he ever got hit in the chest, with a baseball, he could die. So actually, Jay, my colleague, he, you know, we made polymers, took his own cells, and made him a new chest. He's now an adult and, and doing well. And it's also been used to make new skin. I'll, I'll just, that's actually FDA approved. Here's a little boy, very badly burned. But you can take a product. Next slide. And, uh, and, and you can cryopreserve these. It's fibroblasts on a, um, a polymer scaffold. The next slide shows you what happens when the little boy, we put it on at time zero. Let's come back uh, three weeks later, and you see he's doing better. And six months later, on the next slide, he's pretty much healed. These have now been approved for skin ulcers and for burn victims. And, there, and you can actually also now, as people may know, you can use these technologies to grow organs on a chip, uh, to do drug testing. And I thought I'd just end with one last example that we've been working on, again, more with the idea to the future. Could we actually someday make a fully functioning pancreas? This is, is, people have tried this for a long time, but the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation came to see me a number of years ago, and they said, well, the biggest problem, see, all these that we're doing is like you might add immunosuppressive if you're worried about rejection, but the other way of trying to solve the problem is to encapsulate cells like, like beta cells. And, and, and in what's called an immunoisolation membrane. And the idea is that if you got the pores just right, then uh, insulin and glucose could diffuse through it. But antibodies or immune cells would be too big. So it's immunoprotective. And, and there's a substance, alginate, from seaweed that you can actually aqueous. You can do a very simple encapsulation with water. And then you just shoot it into a divalent ion, like calcium or barium, and you look at how the cells are encapsulated. So Dan Anderson, who is one of my postdocs and I, uh, we actually came up with this idea of some combinatorial chemistry, literally made thousands of alginates. Now, most of them didn't work. But we found a couple um, that did. And this is even in non-human primates. And just to show you what happens is if you normally look at what happens to an FDA-approved catheter, it gets encapsulated. But if you coat it with our stuff, it doesn't at all. And uh, we actually published six. There'll be seven papers. Can we go to the next slide? 
uh, in, in different nature journals, really going after the mechanisms of these to, so that you really understand how to get good biocompatibility. And then we published in, um, and this is the last slide, uh, with Doug Melton, we took his slides, I'm sorry, we took his, uh, his beta cells and put them in these capsules and basically cured uh, animals for about a six month period. So again, still in, in animal trials, but the goal was to tell you what's gonna happen in 10 years, and my hope is that a number of these things will, we'll see. So again, really been an honor to go over this with you, and, and, and I should say, as, as everybody here has before me, you know, all this is really due to the people in the lab that do the work. I mean, it, 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 you know, I, I've just been lucky to work with great people. So thank you so much for having me. Question? I mean, from your presentation, it's as if you're already thinking 10 years ahead right now and making it happen. But curious, what, what do you imagine uh, for 10 years' time? Well, I mean, it depends on which area, but I, I, I think, you know, you heard earlier about RNA therapies. I think we'll see a lot of that in 10 years' time, all different types, you know, and you've heard about gene editing. I, I think we'll see examples of that. But... Uh, you know, you, one way to look at tenure, medicine is slow, uh, as the angiogenesis example I gave, you know, from personal experience shows, you know, 28 years from, you know, the initial discovery to a clinical product. But what you can look at is all the clinical trials. And if you look at the different companies doing clinical trials in all these areas, it's, it's really exciting. So I think, you know, what Adrian said before lunch is exactly right. I think, you know, whether it's antisense or siRNA or messenger RNA or gene editing approaches, DNA, I think we'll see a lot of that in the next 10 or 15 years. I think that that's really exciting. I do think, think we'll see more and more cellular therapies. I think the CAR-T example is, is a really exciting example of that, and I very much hope that the kinds of things I talked about in regenerative medicine will be also. So I think those two areas to me are, you know, in terms of moving from sort of the basic science to something that will really help people, I think we'll see hopefully a lot of that in 10 years' time and a, and a lot of treatments that will help a lot of people. But I'm an optimist, but we'll see. Are there any ideas that, you, that, you, that are at a really nascent stage in your lab which are kind of far out and, and, and may have a very small chance of working but, but, but could be transformative? Well, I could probably mention some, and people will probably go back to thinking that I'm nuts, but I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Um, you know, I've had ideas, for example, about how you could change, like, hurricanes, um, I, you know, where you could actually interfere with hurricanes and actually um, try to, again, this is the chemical engineering principle, so where you could affect, you know, hopefully move a hurricane, let's say, that could wreck New Orleans if you knew it, and that was coming, and move it into a tropical storm. I mean, that... You know, that, that, that's one example. I mean, that's not a medical example, but uh, we, we, we probably have some of the, we, there's a number of those too. Okay, thank you. My pleasure, thank you.
Okay, so moving on to our next talk and our next speaker. Um, the next speaker is Zhao Wei Zhuang, who is the David Arnold Professor of Science at Harvard University and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. She's developed new imaging methods for the study of biological systems, including something called STORM, a widely used super resolution imaging method, which has revealed previously unknown cellular structures and for which she won this year's breakthrough prize in life sciences. She also invented a single cell transcriptome imaging method called MRFISH, which has enabled studies of the molecular and cellular organization of tissues at the systems level. And it's a great pleasure to uh, bring our next speaker up, Zhao Wei Shuang, imaging the invisible in living organisms, current state of the art and future. Let me just, uh, wrong ones to see. Okay, good, I'm getting used to this. All right, uh, well, first of all, I would also like to join other speakers to thank the Breakthrough Prize Foundation for uh, put together a really exciting symposium and for including me here and uh, for uh, given me the price. So, <laughs> so what I want to share with you today are uh, some imaging methods uh, that allow us to uh, you know, see the molecular world of life, which would be otherwise uh, invisible. And of course, uh, we were given the instruction that we can not only talk about what's existing, but also future. So I will also get to the end uh, towards uh, some future challenges. Uh, focusing on uh, methods developed in my laboratory, but I'll also cover some other lab set methods. So I was a physicist by training, and when I started, I know how little biology that I knew, so I thought I'd start with something really simple. We all know that, uh, hopefully we all know that uh, human or other animals, uh, living systems, plants, and so on, are made of uh, cells, and cells are made of many, many, many different kinds of molecules. And then I also give you the size scale. The cells are about uh, one uh, to about 100 microns, about the width of your hair, and the uh, molecules are one to 10 nanometer in size. And then so these molecules, as I said, so many different kinds are really interacting in intricate way, forming intricate networks together give the cells life. And we really want to use imaging or direct visualization approaches to visualize these interactions and to understand how do they collectively give uh, the cells life. And then if you think about it, then you would like your imaging approaches to have these properties. Um, uh, you would like to have them to have molecular scale resolution. There are so many different kinds. You would like to have the molecular specificity. And finally, because we are dealing with living systems, things are changing and moving all the time, so we would like to have the dynamic imaging capability. And uh, one of the imaging modalities do these, uh, pretty well, uh, does this pretty well, and that's light microscopy. Uh, especially on these two fronts, the molecular specificity, because uh, we have Light has so many different colors. We have so many different colored probes. We can link them to the molecule of interest with high specificity. And we know light microscopy can be compatible with uh, living system imaging. Traditionally, light microscopy has not been done very well uh, or doing very well, uh, was not doing very well with the molecular scale resolution. Uh, that was because of a very well-known physical property or phenomena called the diffraction limit of light microscopy. In the very simple terms, uh, that means because light is a wave, it diffracts. So when you try to focus a light beam, the light beam has a finite size of about uh, half of the wavelength, 200 nanometer. So it's very hard to resolve or see things smaller than that. And that was known very early on. In 1873, when Ernst Abbe first identified this limit. And I just mentioned that molecules are almost two orders of magnitude smaller, so if we want to so see these molecular interactions, we really need to overcome this diffraction limit. Now I want to say that uh, this, uh, collectively these methods are called super resolution imaging methods. There are different methods out there that can overcome the diffraction limit. So I would like to start with our own, which got uh, me the prize and that is called stochastic optical reconstruction microscopy. So let me give you a little bit more of uh, what the resolution limit means fundamentally. 
because of the limit, no matter how small an object is when you're imaging it, its image has a finite size. When you have two objects that are close, then their finite size images overlap. That overlapping makes it hard to resolve them. That's the fundamental cause of the diffraction limited resolution. So in STORM, how do we overcome that? We think outside the three-dimensional world. We add one more dimension. That's the time dimension. So we do not turn on all the molecules simultaneously so that otherwise the spatially overlapping image will not overlap in time. And then we got to that because prior to that, we uh, discovered photoswitchable dyes that would allow us to do that. So then you can see we activate a subset at a time. We pinpoint their center position uh, with nanometer precision. And then we put these uh, positions together into a high resolution image. And then if I put them together in contrast, this is a cellular structure called microtubule. And then in the same field of view, you can see the diffraction limited image. You can appreciate the resolution gain. And over the years, we've improved the resolution. And now it's already uh, as high as a few nanometers in some systems, which uh, uh, is close to two orders of magnitude better than the original diffraction limit. And it really had allowed us to make uh, interesting biological discoveries of a variety of different cellular structures. And I want to just single out one of them to show you uh, for two reasons. One is, uh, you know, in the early days when I showed the STORM method, people always say, wow, it gives you pretty images. Do you learn something that is really new, not just improving or incrementally improving some existing knowledge? And the structure that I'm showing here demonstrate that you can use super resolution storm imaging to discover cellular structures that people didn't know existed before. And the other is a personal reason because the first author here, Ke Xu, is actually, uh, he was a former postdoc in my lab and then he's now an assistant professor at Berkeley. So, so this is a periodic uh, skeletal structure that we observed uh, in neurons formed by these periodic acting rings uh, connected by another kind of a protein called spectrin. And uh, after that, over the years, we've actually identified many different molecules on this structure and begin to understand a variety of its functions. But I want to show you why the structure was missed before. And that's because, uh, oh, you, th this is a three-dimensional image. So you turn around, these stripes show you the rings that are periodically spaced, as I said, by these pink molecules spectrum. So why are they not seen before? This is why. If you just do the diffraction limited imaging, the distance or the spacing between the rings is below the diffraction limit. So you completely miss that. All right, so uh, as I said, uh, you know, there are multiple different kinds of uh, super resolution imaging approaches and I certainly do not have time to cover all of them in this short symposium. So for those of you who are interested, we have a, uh, a recent review article that is uh, just published in Science uh, a, a month or two ago, where we not only covered a variety of different uh, super resolution imaging methods, including our own methods, uh, methods developed by other laboratories, but focused on biological knowledge that are gained by this. And there really is, it's really a blooming field. And I would like to highlight some of them. You know, uh, in addition to this, uh, uh, what we call spatially stochastic approaches to separate molecules, there are also spatially coordinated approaches uh, to separate molecules and resolving them, uh, such as the pioneering method uh, uh, STED, uh, pioneered by Stefan Hell at Max Planck Institute, a method similar to our stone method to PALM, uh, developed by Eric Betzik, I think who also moved from Julinia Farm <laughs> to, to, to Berkeley. And uh, also you could even use non-optical approaches. For example, you expand the sample and then you use conventional diffraction limited imaging, you can effectively get high resolution. That's called expansion microscopy developed by Ed Boyden's lab. And uh, here I want to show you some of these other approaches. So this is the stat work uh, from uh, Stefan Hell's lab showing you that you can actually look into the living mice brain to see dendritic spine. 
And then here is a uh, lattice Lychee sim method that is uh, very good at get high time resolution and low damage for uh, imaging. And uh, the movie move runs really fast <laughs> on my computer to demonstrate its fast imaging, but this loading didn't show how fast it, I mean, it, it's supposed to be faster, okay? <laughs> so, uh, and then finally, uh, this, uh, yeah, this new mean flux method developed by Stefan Hell's lab to get you, oops, I really need to get used to this quicker. Right, to, to actually get to uh, also, you know, to get to actually single digit nanometer, one to two nanometer resolution, so that you can really uh, see uh, molecular interactions at very fine scale. So uh, the future challenge in my mind, you know, I really would like to have not necessarily just using optical imaging approaches, combine a variety of different imaging approaches that could be light microscopy, including super resolution imaging, electron microscopy, uh, soft x-ray imaging, and so on, to get what, we, what I would call a full molecular architecture of the cell where we see every single molecule, where they are, and how do they interact with each other in a dynamic way. And of course was that you would like to have, you know, satis you would like to satisfy a variety of requirement. And a couple of obvious ones are, you know, you, you have to have molecular or submolecular uh, scale resolution, and you would like to have a reasonably high time resolution and long imaging time so that you could capture the entire uh, molecular processes in real time. But there is a uh, new challenge when you want to get this kind of a full molecular uh, architecture. Remember, as I said, inside the cell, there's not just one or two or three kinds of molecules. There are actually thousands, if not tens of thousands of different genes and even, in, I mean, even small molecules and so on. So if you want to get this kind of a full molecular architecture, we would also like to have this uh, interesting. Oh. All right, let's see. My forward clicking all now are going backward. Okay, you would like to have this uh, genomic scale uh, throughput to vi visualize the collective action of all molecules. And we're uh, making progress towards that direction. So I want to give you one recent method that we uh, developed to called MRFISH, Multiplexed Error Robust Fish. And I won't give you too detailed experimental implementation, but I want to give you the concept of why we can actually image so many different kinds of molecules and distinguish them. Because if you just think about typical imaging approaches, if you want to image three different kinds of molecules, you use three color imaging. If you want to image 10,000 different kinds of molecules, uh, it's not possible to distinguish uh, 10,000 colors because uh, the fluorophore uh, spectrum has a finite width. So how do we deal with that? So, you know, we came up with this pretty simple concept uh, which combine error robust barcoding, combinatorial labeling, and sequential imaging. Uh, sounds like a mouthful, let me just uh, Simplify that. So for each, this one we apply to RNA first. So for each RNA, we give it a binary barcode, 10, 10, 10, and so on. And then we label it so that we can imprint this barcode onto this RNA. Forgive me that without the proper time, I mean, it's sufficient time, I, I won't be able to get into that encoding process. But what happened after the encoding process is we read out them sequentially. In the first round, we read only those RNAs. Their first bit reads one, but not zero. And in the second round, we read out those RNAs or detect those RNAs. Their second bit reads one, but not zero, and so on and so forth. After n rounds of imaging, you can ask this very simple question, and that is how many different kinds of RNA species you can distinguish. And you are all super clever, so you probably can come up with the answer right away. That's two to the nth. Right? So if you just do simple 16 rounds of imaging, you can distinguish 65,000 different kinds of RNAs, which is the whole transcriptome scale. Um, as, we, uh, as I presented this uh, idea to my lab, we all get very excited, but then soon we found the picture was just a little too good to be true because uh, the error also propagates. Each bit of error 
can be small, 16-bit add together can be substantial. That's why we did the error of bust of barcoding. So with that, we have already demonstrated the ability to image some th a thousand R different RNA species inside cell. And, uh, we also applied it to DNA to actually can see the three-dimensional organization of DNA, which is critical for gene expression regulation. And then here is another thing that I want to talk about what I consider to be a major future challenge is we would like to have whole genome DNA imaging, whole genome RNA imaging, and also even though RNA gives you the expression profile, which I will show later to be very important, a lot of the functional molecules inside the cell are proteins, and we would like to get whole genome protein imaging. That is harder to do, okay? But there are labs, uh, in the world, around the world that are trying that, and we are interested in trying that too. So uh, these are for the molecular architectures inside the cell. But as we invent this approach, actually one of the major applications that we invent, at a, actually as a goal that I had for the Smurfish method, is to go back a little bit in thinking about this diagram and in think that inside our body, there are so many, many, many different kinds of cells too. You, you know, a actually human body have some kind of a 30 to 40 trillion cells, and they are really many different kinds. And the problem is we don't even know how many different types of cells we have. And not only that, they form intricate spatial organization, and the spatial organization is critical for the tissue function and eventually for organ function and then for, for you know, uh, living, living beings and so on. So when we are able to do what we consider tr gene expression profiling of individual cells or measuring quantitatively the expression levels of thousands of RNAs simultaneously in a cell, that actually offer us a quantitative and systematic way to identify what type of cells we have, because ultimately, why are they different? Not because they have different genome, they largely share similar genome, but because different genes are expressed to different levels inside the cell, okay? So, and then by doing an imaging approach, we not only can identify these different type of cells, we can directly see where they are, because it's an in-tissue imaging approach. So I'm just gonna quickly go through a couple of slides. You know, this is uh, our recent work of a, uh, in co collaboration with Catherine Dulac, my uh, uh, colleague at the uh, Harvard uh, Department of Molecular Cell Biology and uh, her lab. And uh, so this is a really fun collaboration. And this is a Murphish image of a small region of the brain. And then we can see many, many different kinds of RNA molecules what they are, where they are inside the cell, and identify the cell type. And since there are too many kinds imaged, you might not even know what to see here. So I actually can pare it down a little bit, showing you just eight of the major cell markers. And then you can immediately see, oh, these are inhibitory cell markers, so they're inhibitory neurons. These blue ones are excitatory cell markers. They are excitatory neurons, and so on and so forth. And we imaged a much larger region than this, a block of region, which is important for uh, called the preoptic region of the uh, mouse hypothalamus, which is important for social behavior, for uh, essential functions such as eating, drinking, and so on and so forth. And then uh, we actually not only identify these major cell mark, uh, classes, uh, but also 70 different types of neurons just in this one region of the brain. Tells you how complicated it is. I'm gonna skip this part except to say that not only we can see where they are, we can see which neuron perform which function. And then eventually this is the kind of a map, what we call a molecular and spatial and functional cell atlas of this particular brain region, the hypothalamic uh, preoptic region. And in this region here are different kinds of cells in different colors. And then if I just slightly move a little bit, and you can see how the spatial organization changed dramatically. And then, uh, as I said, in this, uh, we not only know what are these cells, their molecular property, but importantly, the function they play, whether they're important in parenting or whether they're important in fighting and so on. And if I just blow up, you can really appreciate the beauty of this kind of uh, cell atlas. And then, uh, 
I want to say that uh, there are also other labs who develop other kinds of approaches, uh, for example, in-situ sequencing approaches uh, by uh, Mass Nielsen Lab, uh, George Church Lab, and the uh, Carl Dysroth lab, and then here I show you a beautiful work of Carl Dysroth lab's so star map approach that gives you a beautiful map of a brain cortical region, different cell types, and so on. And then uh, ultimately the, the, the ch ch challenge is uh, really we want to get the entire hum human cell atlas. What are the different types of cells that are present? How are they organized spatially? What are their functions? How do they communicate with each other? And how do they go wrong in diseases? And it's just like, uh, you know, if we zoom out, you see the human being like a globe like this. But if we zoom in, we want to see a Google Earth map for cells in our human body. And uh, I should say that this is a really a global initiative uh, that is uh, being planned, and then it will be a collaborative effort of many, many labs around the world using a variety of different approaches, not just imaging approaches, but also other approaches such as sequencing-based approaches and so on. Okay, so with that, I also would like to, you know, since we're professors, uh, you know, we uh, know a lot of the actual work, they're really done by the heroic students and postdocs. Uh, you know, they're day to day, you know, being not only very creative, but also being persistent and not afraid of momentary setbacks and just uh, working hard to make things happen. So I would like to thank generations of uh, students in my lab. But we also enjoyed uh, collaborations with many labs. As for example, this uh, brain mapping is a very nice stimulating collaboration with uh, Catherine Dulac's lab and many other labs. Uh, and thank you all for, for your attention. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, my question is about the super resolution imaging and its limits. So are there any fundamental limits to what super resolution imaging can do? And if not, what are the trade-offs and limiting factors for currently available techniques? Yeah, so uh, we like to call these uh, diffraction unlimited methods. So, so there is not really physical principle to actually limit you to a particular resolution anymore, but there are very important practical limitations. One thing is all these super resolution imaging approaches, these fluorescence imaging approaches, they rely on tags. These are fluorophores that are tagged to the endogenous molecule of interest. So the endogenous uh, molecules in our body do not give enough light for us to see that. And these fluorescent tag molecules, even the small organic molecules uh, like fluorescent dyes, they have about one nanometer kind of a size. So at the moment, they do impose that practical limit. But, you know, you could imagine developing different kind of uh, light emitting probes so with new chemistry that get to much smaller that can still be attached to uh, biological molecules of interest with specificity and so on. So there you go, you just added another future challenge. Okay, so uh, first of all, let me thank you so much for asking this question. I didn't even explain this uh, structure. These structures are not all microtubules. These are uh, what we call periodic, a membrane associate periodic skeleton. They're right underneath the membrane of uh, exon is where we first detected that, and then later on we and others have seen it in dendrites too. So they're directly associated with the membrane. Uh, so that, I just use this as an opportunity to clarify where this structure is. And an important function is to actually anchor functional membrane proteins. Why are they not detected by electron microscopy is your question. It's a super good question because uh, it should have been. And uh, uh, I think one of the reason is, uh, you know, electron microscopy has that resolution. 
Now, if you want to do cryo EM, the contrast is very difficult yet for the membrane, because it's directly associated with membrane, actually the contrast is pretty difficult for seeing this. But you could do amino labeling like amino gold labeling. Now, the problem it was not seen before, you know, scientific discovery always have some serendipity in it, is uh, this kind of structure, people didn't know it existed before. But the ring is made of acting. Acting exists in a different kinds of form, previously well known inside the Southeast acting filament. They're highly dynamic, they form and dissemble very rapidly. So in order to actually capture that by electron microscopy, you need to fix them so rapidly to beat that dynamics. So you want the fixative to go into the cell super rapidly. And what people have previously been doing is they add detergent to live neurons and try, or other cell types to try to get rid of the membrane so that the fixative can get into it. This is a membrane associated structure. So if you add det detergent to live cells, the membranes are gone, the structure is gone. So luckily they didn't see it, so left for us to discover. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And moving on, we're, our next speaker is going to be uh, Jean Millay, who is the Christopher Brown Distinguished Professor of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Pennsylvania. He is a theoretical physicist with primary research interests in quantum, quantum mechanical phenomena and novel electronic materials, including conducting polymers, graphene, and topological materials. Uh, this is particularly near and dear to my heart because this is my own my own subfield of research as well. So it's a great pleasure to be introducing Gene today. Um, Gene shared this year's Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics for his co-discovery of topological insulators, and his title is The Winding Road from Topological Insulators. So. Okay, so am I good volume? Good, thanks. So uh, let me first say that I'm greatly honored to be a member of the incoming class of 2019 Breakthrough Prize uh, laureates. It's a very exciting time. Um, so um, I have a talk that I, usually, that I usually give that introduces people to topological insulators to, to a general audience. The title that I usually give, I should go over here for this, I guess, is The Winding Road to Topological Insulators. And I discovered a few weeks back that this would be an inappropriate title for this group because I got an email from, uh, from uh, 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 Adam, uh, which says that we don't want you to talk about what led up to the prize. We want you to, uh, to instead sort of take your ideas and look forward perhaps 10 years uh, in the field. So, so, so there's been a slight change of plans, and so I slightly changed the title to be the, uh, the, the winding road from, from, from topological insulators. So uh, let's see. Yeah, one theme that will go through everything I'll tell you about this afternoon is uh, the importance of optimism. I, I would say sort of generally in life, but in particular in the kind of physics that I'll tell you about. And I thought it might be helpful to start with a quote. Okay, I like this quote. It's oddly appropriate to what I'll tell you about. It's from George Carlin, who's an uh, important philosopher in the second part of the 20th century, if you don't know. That some people see, see the glass as half, half full, others see it as half empty. I see a glass that's twice as big as it needs to be. And that's, uh, I, think, I think, very appropriate. Um, I'd like to illustrate with a few examples where I think in our own work, we were insufficiently optimistic and surprised. And uh, I'll point, for example, to this paper that was cited uh, in our award, this work on graphene. Uh, and this was the idea that you could have gap systems which would behave in an in interesting topological manner. And all the important stuff has to go on with what's going on in this gap in here. But the one problem, there's a big but on this slide. 
the, okay, the but is that that gap was not drawn nearly to scale. It, had you drawn it to scale, you wouldn't have actually seen it on this plot. It would have been basically zero. And it would hard be, you know, be hard to imagine that anyone would actually get so, get so interested about that. Uh, and we actually tried to estimate the size of the gap in there. And in fact, in trying to do it quantitatively, we also made a very generous approximation in order to actually see how big, uh, uh, how big it might be. But in both cases, I think one could criticize us for being not sufficiently optimistic. I'll just give you a few examples. There is an unanticipated response in the following literature to this subject. So we're starting by looking at a very sort of a simple and interesting problem, and there was, a, I think, an unanticipated uh, 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 response to it. Um, this is something that's in the current literature, actually, is uh, looking at new discoveries of materials that actually do this. And to our surprise, in a database of 40,000 uh, 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 inorganic compounds, roughly 8,000 of them have the right character to do, to, uh, to, to do um, what we were describing in that paper. And the ideas uh, have actually spun off into related ideas in topological, what's called topological mechanics now, and even topological, uh, 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 topological um, pho um, pho photonics. Um, so in view of that, I think it's useful to sort of 15 years or so after the fact to ask what we should have been noticing very early on in that problem, and that will be a guide for us going forward. I mean, what, you know, what could you have seen early on that would have told you that this was going to break in this way? And I would actually summarize it by sort of three fundamental ideas. Um, the ideas are that, first of all, the fundamental ideas were portable and could be easily applied to lots of different systems. That was quite important. That those systems were, secondly, makeable, that people could actually make them in the lab, that, they were, that, that these were not sort of one of type, type, type of uh, materials, but one could actually make them easily. And they were accessible using existing tools of spectroscopy and transport measurements and so forth. Um, of the three, if you ask, ask me to pick the most important one, which is like asking a parent to pick the favorite one of his three children, uh, I think the most important one is the second, okay, that these things are makeable. And I would say going forward, the high ground in a field like this is going to be held by people who can make the stuff and make it in high quality and make it well. And so that'll be a guideline for what I'm going to tell you about about the future. That's, that's all the past, now it's the future. So, uh, so looking forward. So I would say that there's two kinds of predictions that I can make for you this afternoon. And one is predictions made with near certainty because it's already happening. We can see it right now. We know the current gradient. I'll tell you a little bit about what we, you know, what, what we see happening right away uh, based on some of these ideas. And then we'll turn to uh, a dicier business which is predictions made with no certainty, okay? And this is actually further out and more speculative possible, but we don't really know. So let's start with the, uh, with the near certainty, okay? So this is an idea which is actually very popular right now. It's inventing classes of materials, which are very high quality materials actually, by starting with two-dimensional well-ordered primitives and then stacking them in some order. The idea that you could do this was um, sort of written down in a prescient paper by Geim and, Gr and Gregorieva a few years back, who pointed to the fact that since we had lots of possible primitives, there were lots of interesting possibilities for, you know, for when these things are stacked and how, the, um, um, and how they'll behave. And uh, that is actually a very interesting idea. I would tell you that the basic idea here is a 21st century of an idea that was hatched a long time ago in quantum wells, quantum well engineering in the 70s, with a huge difference. Uh, I didn't want to get too political here, but I will for a moment. Uh, in the 70s, that basic idea of making new materials by stacking other ones was something that was conceived of, and I would say owned by the, by the aristocracy. It was the domain of the privileged and the few. You had to have special machines, special devices, special labs to do it. it was very important work, but really the, really the uh, domain of, uh, of the few. But what's going on right now, okay, in the current version of this, you know, following this paper basically, is many people can do this. The field, I would say, is being democratized. Even small labs can do these things and do them in very high quality. And that's a really important development. Uh, and so let me just show you a few examples of that. I would say that when this idea was first put out there, the general response was, again, not enough optimism, insufficient optimism. The notion was that this is actually just too low tech to actually give you anything that is ultimately useful. Um, 
Now, what I did here was to take this as the objection from this fellow Simplicio, who you might know as a character in Galileo's dialogues. And one thing about the dialogues, if you recall, is those characters are actually named after or, or characterized after real people, clergy, politicians, that kind of stuff, people who are actually, you know, actually around. And so my response to that is uh, a real person in the modern age who's Corey Dean. Okay, so Corey Dean has built these kinds of things, and I'll show you an example of that. He uh, takes some graphene, he peels it off, he turns it around, he contacts it and so forth. That's the object and does some transport spectroscopy on it. And when he does that, he sees this. That's conductance okay, as a function of band filling. And uh, the experts in the audience will recognize that plot as the unmistakable footsteps of electrons locked in a tightly choreographed waltz, which is possible only in the most perfect materials under the most perfect, you know, you know, under the most perfect of conditions. So this kind of thing really works, and, uh, to, and to further the optimism, uh, the palette of 2D things that can be put in there is growing. Within the last year, we know that one can make two-dimensional magnets, which eat with, uh, with their, uh, sorry, two, 2D, 2D superconductors, okay, like so. 2D magnets with moments either out of the plane or in the plane, okay. 2D ferroelectrics, which are nearly atomically thin. Actually, it takes two layers to actually get it to work but that's pretty good. And of course, uh, 2D quantum spin Hall states. So these are things that can be ma you know, actually made routinely, put together uh, in, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, in controlled stacks. They can be put together in desired combinations to produce some optimal, optimal functionality, as illustrated here. Uh, and one thing that occurs that is not really possible when you just do ordinary you know, MBE quantum well engineering is that when these things are put down, their orientation is now a relevant degree of freedom. So if you take the simplest version of that, two sheets of graphene, and lay one on the other, slightly twisted, what you wind up with are these beautifully well-ordered moray patterns. So this is now moray optimism, where one is building out 2D regular lattices that would be very, very hard to control by any, you know, by any simple, simple means of, uh, of a synthesis. And those systems, what we have here, they can actually be literally dialed in on demand. The first few discoveries of this actually found those kinds of things serendipitously. This is actually an experimental slide of a device in which one with a stylus will go in and turn the angle and tune between different materials in a single platform. And if you hit a, what's called a magic angle, then magic happens. And in this case, the magic is that there are insulating states where they shouldn't be and superconducting states near those insulating states. So there's actually quite a bit of interesting activity going on in that kind of area right now. Um, okay. So, so, so with that, let's look forward then and look at predictions that can be made, but made with somewhat less certainty. Okay. And uh, so the basic idea here is that uh, we're talking about 2D materials, but we live in a 3D world. And 2D materials lifted, lifted into a 3D world offer yet another kind of functionality that's going to be important. Uh, a version of this was actually, uh, you know, a foray in this area occurred a few years back in some work done by Paul McEwen's group. What they realized is they could take a graphene and etch it so it had holes. And graphene that can be, you know, it's already very, you know, quite stretchable. With the holes, it's even more stretchable. And what this uh, shows is the effect of a large pool on the graphene, so it actually gets deformed in a shape that one can model as a piece of paper with holes in it that's being pulled on its ends. What these guys noticed is, is that if you did that, you would hardly change at all the electrical behavior of the system, uh, which is true, but I would then say that they were not being sufficiently optimistic. Uh, actually, the most interesting thing is, what's going on here is the holes are giving the curvature in that sheet a place to hide. They get out of the graphene and into the holes. That's why it doesn't be, you know, uh, that's why it doesn't, uh, doesn't really perturb the, the, uh, the electronic behavior. But if you weren't to do that, okay, it is known that if you take the graphene and don't let the curvature escape, that the electrons that are moving on the graphene feel as though they're moving in the presence of a strong magnet. And one difference between this and a real magnet is the magnetic fields that, that you get are just, you know, are, uh, are just preposterously large. They're ones you can't really achieve in any terrestrial magnetic lab. In this case here, the spectroscopy indicates an effective field uh, of order 300 Tesla, and actually this is a fairly small version of that. Okay. So, uh, so what this is is a piece of graphene 
on, I think it's a little plat platinum island that is forced to stretch it into this shape. Um, now, we also know that you don't even have to do it that way. There's another way of doing this, which is to take the graphene, make incisions, let the incisions heal themselves, and that will drive the graphene into the shape automatically. This is now a freestanding version, what, a freestanding version of what we had over here on the right. So that's not on a support, that's just a piece of graphene that has healed its incisions and has stretched itself so as to produce these internal very large fields. Uh, so, well, you know, our group is currently studying this, and I give this date 2019 because I'm being optimistic that we'll actually have it published in 2019. So uh, uh, now there's a, this is a very promising area, this idea about bringing 2D systems into three dimensions. Uh, there's been a very interesting foray in this by Roger's group who has their eyes on, you know, sort of, you know, biological applications of this kind of thing. What they're doing is doing this thing uh, with silicon, uh, silicon which is formed in very thin films and then patterned in such a way that by applying potentials to piezoelectrics, one can get it to actually change its shape from being flat to being in, uh, to being, to being in some controlled, in some controlled um, 3D shape over here. Uh, now this really requires just conventional transduction of signals to mechanical strains, but uh, you don't have to do it that way. You can make it even smaller and have the interaction with the environment give you the strains. So this is now autonomous assembly of very small things, which has been demonstrated in a paper, a paper last year by McEwen's group, and that's going down now at the 10 micron level, okay? And one can push it, uh, uh, push it further. Um, oh yeah, so there's you know, a famous quote about this. This is you know, looking forward back in 1959, the famous APS talk by Feynman who said there's plenty of room at the bottom. Small stuff is gonna be very important in the future. And if we go to McEwen's webpage today, this is, there's now an action call that says, do anything as long you know, as, long as it's small. Uh, the whole situation reminds me a little bit of when I was a kid, uh, there was this movie, okay, Kleiner's screenplay, The Fantastic Voyage. And you know the story there, the scientist is sick, he shrinks people down, they go in, they find out what's wrong, and they fix it. Uh, in researching this, I found that movie is now in re-release, and I found a review which I've included here. Irresistibly goofy, you won't forget it, okay. So, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so what do we see? So at the moment, um, uh, to be optimistic, I would say one sees a confluence of ideas from physics, chemistry, mathematics, geometry, of, uh, 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 and the arts. Something is gonna happen, that's for sure. Um, I thought I might sort of conclude that with a quote, something like, expect the unexpected, but I'm gonna decline to do that because when I was writing the talk, I found myself reprimanded on this quote by the Urban, Dic by the Urban Dictionary, who said that quote is kind of moronic uh, you shouldn't use it as a cutesy phrase, and it doesn't, you know, you know, doesn't make any sense. And I guess I'm going to take that criticism seriously, uh, and instead, okay, and instead, uh, thank the people who really got the area of topological insulators going in the early days. Uh, here are a dozen of the leading people who really pushed this, pushed this out of the starting blocks some time ago. So thank you. So, so can, can you define in simple terms what is topological insulator? Yeah, so it is an insulator which, uh, as, uh, if, if you were to pull the atoms apart, you can't get it back to a system of isolated atoms. Basically, there's no way of taking a system of isolated atoms and joining, it, joining, joining them together in such a way that the state you get when they're close together is actually in a topological insulating state. Okay. It's got to be separated by some phase transition through a state that is actually conductive. Okay, thank you.
Okay, and for our uh, the fourth and last talk of this early afternoon session, um, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Ji John Chen, who I guess goes by the name of James. Hoping that's true. Uh, I'm looking for confirmation that I'm not just making that up. Uh, is a professor of molecular biology, and he is the George McGregor Distinguished Chair in Biomedical Science at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. He's also an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So he has made a series of discoveries that transformed our understanding of cell signaling and of innate immunity. These include the MAVS protein, MAVS protein, that revealed a new role for mitochondria in immunity, and the DNA sensor C, uh, I'm not even gonna try and say this, C-gas? C-gas. <laughs> He'll tell you more about what that is. I'm not, for which he won this year's Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences. So it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Chijan Chen with a title of Inflammation 2030, Modern Disease Caused by an Old Flame. Right. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And I also want to thank the Breakthrough Foundation for the very prestigious prize and uh, the honor uh, to speak here. So I'm gonna talk about a rather old topic, inflammation. About 2,000 years ago, uh, an influential physician, Celsus, defined inflammation as having four symptoms, redness, swelling, heat, and pain. At around the same time, a Chinese doctor, Zhang Zhongjing, wrote the theory of injury and cold, and that forms the basis for the traditional Chinese medicine that is still being practiced today. Fast forward to the 19th century, Rudolf Virchow, uh, who uh, is considered the father of cellular pathology, uh, consider information uh, as a, a disturbance of function. So basically, information cause pathology. At around the same time, Eddie Maklikov, uh, who is considered the father of innate immunity, discovered phagocytosis and he won the Nobel Prize for this discovery. And Magnikov considered inflammation as a normal physiological response to infections and tissue injury. So also in the 19th century, Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur uh, proposed the germ theory of disease. They demonstrated that infections uh, are the major cause of inflammation and disease. Since then, in the past century, we now have uh, gained a tremendous understanding of our immune system. We now know that our immune system uh, 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 has both innate immunity and adaptive immunity. And the innate immunity is the first night of defense against microbial infections. After our cells, are infected by a virus, uh, for example, influenza virus. Our innate immune system is activated to provide the uh, immediate defense against these infections. Then a few days later, our T cells and B cells are calling to eradicate the infections. So how do we know that uh, if our bodies have been uh, attacked by a virus? or bacteria. We have sensors, and one of the most uh, uh, important sensors are the Tori receptors, the discovery of which won the Nobel Prize uh, for Jules Hoffman uh, and Bruce Boyder. So these receptors recognize molecules from bacterium or virus, and they trigger a signal, signal transduction cascade that lead to the activation of some transcription factors, such as NF-CoV, which function as master regulators that turn on uh, 
the expression of many genes that are important in immune and inflammatory responses. Now, beyond TOR. So TOR receptors are obviously very important in innate immunity, but that's not the whole story. Because these receptors are membrane proteins with a ligand binding domain facing outside the cells. So these receptors detect pathogens outside our, our cells, and they are largely blind to these bugs that have successfully invaded our cells and replicated inside our cells. So we need another mechanism to detect these infections. And one mechanism is to de detect DNA uh, from these microorganisms. So I, I'm sure all of you know DNA is the genetic material. But DNA also has a dark side, and that is it can trigger uh, immune responses and sometimes autoimmune diseases. In fact, DNA has, known, has been known to uh, stimulate immune responses for more than a century. When Magnikov received his Nobel Prize in 1908 for the discovery of phagocytosis, he noted in his Nobel lecture that there are surgeons in France and Germany who introduce into the abdominal cavity or under the skin of the patients either warm blood serum or nucleic acid or with the object of bringing to the skin a protective army of phagocytes to wall the microbes off. So back then, there was no antibiotics. So surgeons inject DNA into the patients to prevent infections uh, when they perform surgery. So DNA was known to stimulate immune responses 40 years be before it was known to be the genetic material. So why do we want to have an immune system that detects uh, DNA? First of all, it's versatile. With the exception of RNA viruses, all microorganisms including DNA, vir DNA viruses, retroviruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites, they all have DNA or require DNA in the life cycle. And that provides an almost universal mechanism to detect microbial infections. And secondly, the detection of DNA allows our immune system to uh, detect these microorganisms that have successfully invaded our cells and, and replicated inside our cells, as I mentioned earlier. But this system has its uh, liability because our cells have lots of DNA, and one solution to this problem is to keep our DNA out of the cytoplasm. We keep our DNA in the nucleus or in the mitochondria. But this uh, mechanism is not perfect, and when the system fails, it can lead to autoimmune diseases such as lupus, arthritis, uh, a host of inflammatory diseases, as well as cancer. So how does DNA trigger immune response? What's the DNA sensor, and that's where we came in. So here is a cell, here's a virus, the virus infect the cell, and if this were a bacterial cell, you know what to do with this, right? You have CRISPR, <laughs> you heard this morning. But animal cells don't have CRISPR, so we had a different system, uh, and this this is the DNA sensor that we discovered a few years ago, which we call CGAS. It stands for cyclic GMP AMP synthase. So it's an enzyme. And this enzyme binds to DNA directly. Oop, I want to go back. So it binds to DNA directly, and it be becomes activated. So uh, DNA binding causes a conformational change of this enzyme. So basically the shape of this enzyme changes and it rearranges the active site of this enzyme. And so now this enzyme is activated and it will use ATP and GTP as the substrate to make uh, this cyclic dinucleotide, di dinucleotide, cyclic GMP, AMP, we call it CGAMP. So you, uh, probably all know about cyclic AMP in the high school textbook, which is a second messenger. And this one is different. It's a cyclic dinucleotide, cyclic uh, GMP, AMP. So, so this enzyme makes the small molecule CGAM, and this molecule then functions as a second messenger. Whoop, that's too fast. So uh, it functions as a second messenger that 
uh, binds to a target protein called Sting, and now Sting is activated, and it will activate these transcription factors, uh, NFKB and IR3, and these proteins then move into the nucleus to turn on hundreds of genes that mediate immune and inflammatory responses. So that's how we fight infections by a, a large variety of pathogens, including uh, viruses and bacteria. But it turns out that CGAS does a, a lot more than that. Uh, work from our lab as well as from many other labs have recently shown that CGAS uh, is not only important for immune defense against these microbial pathogens, but it's also important for anti-tumor immunity, for cellular senescence, and a lot of uh, autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. And that is because CGAS is activated by any double-stranded DNA, independent of the DNA sequence. So it can be activated by microbial DNA. It can also be activated by our own DNA. So if our own DNA gets out of the nucleus into the cytosol or out of the mitochondria into the cytosol, then it would can, uh, trigger CGAS to cause uh, autoimmune diseases and, and other inflammatory diseases. So basically, this is uh, our discovery. Uh, CGAS is the DNA sensor. And it's activated through a very uh, simple mechanism. It binds to DNA directly. And that binding causes this enzyme to be activated to produce this small molecule second messenger that then potently trigger uh, innate immunity. And this pathway can be targeted for treating human diseases. Uh, we have shown that, uh, that uh, in some autoimmune diseases, such as this one, Akati Kutia syndrome, which uh, have mutations in some enzymes. Uh, and these mutations then cause cytoplasmic DNA to accumulate, and they would trigger these diseases. And in mouse models, if we remove just one copy of the CGAS uh, gene, then we can basically rescue the disease. And uh, others have shown that CGAS can be involved in other inflammatory diseases, including uh, Parkinson's disease, as shown recently by Richard Yu's lab at NIH. So uh, inhibitors of this enzyme could potentially uh, have many uses in these autoimmune diseases and, and uh, age-related diseases. And conversely, this small molecule, CGAM, is a very potent inducer of innate immunity. And that suggests that we can use this, uh, mo this small molecule uh, as a vaccine adjuvant or use that directly for cancer immunotherapy. And, uh, and, and indeed, uh, Companies have now spent tons of money uh, targeting this pathway, and hopefully something good will be coming out of this. Now, looking into the future, the next decade, uh, so to have the crystal ball, uh, it will be informative to look back uh, at the uh, past century, and, and quite remarkably, the human lifespan uh, has increased dramatically. So in, in the, uh, about 100 years ago, a, an average American lived about 50 years old. And now it's close to about 80 years. And, and this dramatic increase of lifespan is due in large part to the invention of vaccines and antibiotics, as well as uh, widespread uh, uh, sanitation eff effort. So thanks to vaccines and antibiotics, now uh, we have become better at uh, dealing with infectious diseases, although this is still a big problem in third world countries. But now we live longer, but then we have other problems, uh, these age-related diseases, cancer, autoimmune disease, uh, diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, etc. And one thing that's common about among these diseases is that they all have inflammation in the absence or in the apparent absence of infections uh, or, or sterile uh, inflammation. And many conditions can cause sterile inflammation, like tissue injury, cellular stress, radiation, obesity, etc. And, and also old age. And many of these conditions actually impinge on DNA 
to cause inf inflammation. So to look at this disease, first let's take a look at cancer, which is still the uh, top killer. Every year, millions of uh, cancers, pa cancer patients die. It's estimated that about 16 people die of cancer every minute. So it's still a major problem. And as you all know, that uh, immunotherapy is a recent breakthrough in our fight against cancer. For example, uh, PD-1 and PD-1 antibodies work by removing the break that prevent T cells from killing tumor cells. And this is a, a summary of uh, clinical trials of uh, these uh, PD-1, PD-1 antibodies from different companies is not the most updated, but it tells the message. So for some tumors, such as uh, melanomas, the response to these antibodies is quite good. It's close to, to about 50%. But for some other tumors, like prostate cancer and, and pancreatic cancer, they don't respond well. So on average, um, across tumor types, it's about 20% of cancer patients respond to uh, these uh, antibody therapies. And that means there are uh, still many patients who cannot benefit from these therapies. So uh, why is that? <clears throat> uh, so I, I would like to think of cancer immunity as like driving a car, okay? So you need to uh, uh, take away the brake and you also need to give it some gas. And some patients, they already have some gas, so all you need to do is to take away the break, say, with a PD-1 antibody. But for most patients, they don't have enough gas. So you need to um, give them some gas, and C-gas is one type of gas. So, um, so working towards a cure for cancer, I think we need to discover more breaks uh, uh, in addition to PD-1, PD-1. PD we need to target the gas or immune stimuli to tumors such that we can have local anti-tumor immunity while reducing systemic toxicity. And hopefully we can design T cells that are better than the CAR T cells or chimeric antigen receptor T cells. So for CAR T cell th uh, therapy, you need to remove T cells from patients, engineer them in vitro, and then put them back into patients, which is uh, very, uh, tedious and uh, actually in a few years it will probably look primitive. And, and so uh, ideally you want to, we want the T cells to be more generic. You can use it off the uh, shelf uh, and you can uh, deliver this to uh, many different t uh, cancer patients without causing immune uh, rejections. You want these T cells to be modular, uh, just like this, hopefully you can make sort of one T cells and just change the warhead against different tumors instead, instead of making sort of one T cells for one tumor antigen. You want this to be uh, guided, uh, targeted tumors and overcome the immune suppressive environment uh, in, in the tumors. And you want to have the safety valve, safety valve uh, if uh, these T cells over proliferate or uh, they cause very, uh, too strong uh, immune reaction then you want these T cells to self-destruct. All right, so, uh, so immunity is all about balance. Uh, if we are the balance of yin and yang, uh, if we don't have enough in immunity, we can have cancer and, and uh, infectious diseases, or if we have uh, sort of over-activated uh, uh, immune system, they misfire, then it can cause these autoimmune diseases. And as we live longer, now there are more autoimmune diseases or more patients with autoimmune diseases. Uh, now there are many different types of autoimmune diseases. It's estimated one in 12 Americans suffer auto, autoimmune diseases. And most of these are chronic inflammatory diseases. It's chronic inflammatory diseases that don't have good treatment options. So what can we do about this? So, we need to have a much better understanding of the cause of the diseases at a molecular and cellular level. And with such understanding, then we may be able to apply gene therapies, CRISPR or anti-sense uh, therapies, 
or cell therapies, such as stem cell therapies, to treat these diseases. And if we can identify the culprit of these diseases, then we can develop large or uh, small molecules uh, as therapies. For example, if C, C gas activation uh, is the cause of some autoimmune diseases, then we want to develop inhibitors of this enzyme to treat these diseases. And I believe that in the next decade, the AI or computer-assisted assisted drug design will play an increasingly uh, uh, more important role in, uh, in this space. So in summary, we have known for a long time that in inflammation is caused by uh, infections, tissue injury, and cellular stress. At the molecular level, uh, we know that our immune system detects uh, uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns of PAMs or danger-associated molecular patterns or DAMs. And as we become more successful in dealing with infectious diseases, say with the use of vaccines, antibiotics, or antiviral molecules, we live longer. But now, DAMs or uh, sterile inflammation has become a major cause of these modern human diseases. And I think that for humans to live uh, longer and, and healthier life, uh, we need a magic bullet or an antibiotic-like molecule that can deal with sterile inflammation. And relevant to our own work, uh, I just want to remind you that DNA is both a PAMP and a DAMP, and CGAS is a major DNA sensor that causes uh, inflammation. And finally, I want to thank uh, uh, the people who did the work. I have been very fortunate to, associate, uh, to be associated with a very talented uh, and dedicated team, and in particular, um, I want to thank uh, uh, two very talented biochemists, Josh Sun and Josh Yi Wu, uh, for their major contributions to the discovery of CGAS and CGAM. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes, yeah. I wonder if you would comment on uh, to what extent your observations on sea gas might uh, explain the great female predominance in many autoimmune disorders. Do you, does that, can you speculate about how, what might be an underlying or Explanation in view of your own work? No, I think it's still a mystery. And uh, uh, so, for example, like in lupus, you know, it's like nine to one ratio and female to, to male. Uh, and it's really not clear why uh, females, uh, you know, are more sort of susceptible to, to lupus. For, and um, it, so I, I don't have an answer to your question. I think it's a very interesting question, very important question, and I think a lot of people are trying to understand that. Uh, whether it's related to DNA or not, uh, it's not clear. It's hormonal, it's, it's related to pregnancy. Uh, it's not clear. <laughs> okay, uh, so I wonder what happens during mitosis because the nuclear envelope will open and would the CGAS do something over there? Yes, I, yeah, it's a... Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, so during mitosis, uh, nuclear envelope breakdowns, and we uh, actually have a movie that shows that that uh, that you know after nuclear envelope breakdown, the C gas would um, be associated with chromatin beautifully, but it's not activated. And and we're still trying to understand why this is the case, how C gas is prevented from getting activated during mitosis, and we have several sort of uh, interesting mechanisms that we are trying to work out. So very similar molecules are used within bacteria for signaling. <clears throat> and it seems like this is an opportunity for bacteria to really get in and mess with eukaryotes to be able to produce 
the dicyclic nucleotides to mess it up. Any thoughts on that? Right. So, um, so bacteria can also produce a cyclic dinucleotide called cyclic GMP or cyclic AMP, um, and 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 they make these molecules for the bacterial lifestyle, you know, they, for their own good. And but it can also trigger uh, immune responses. Whether this is good or bad for them, um, it uh, I think it depends. So bacteria. Uh, you know, if you induce interferons, it's bad for viruses, but it's good for some bacteria. So, uh, you know, maybe some bacteria will take advantage of that. Uh, and the other thing is that bacteria and viruses, they, they have mechanisms to antagonize this pathway uh, they, by either inhibiting C gas or, uh, or the downstream components. <laughs> Uh, I'm wondering about like SIGAS binding any cytoplasmic DNA, and is there any specific sequence associated to specific autoimmune diseases, and then that you can introduce a specificity to SIGAS to just target those specific diseases? Are you, talk are you talking about whether the binding, has, that whether you... there's any specificity in DNA sequence or what type of DNA? As far as we know, it, uh, it does not have any DNA sequence uh, specificity. Even if we make modifications in the base in the base, like you know, oxidation or methylation, it does not really um, affect its ability to activate C gas. Uh, so it needs double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA doesn't work. Longer DNA works better than short DNA, and recently we published a paper to explain why long DNA is much more potent than, uh, than short DNA in activating C gas that's related to this phenomenon called uh, phase separation. And uh, Double-stranded RNA, <laughs> they can also bind to C gas, but they don't activate C gas because they don't cause the right type of conformational change that, that I showed you earlier. So it, it is quite specific to double-stranded DNA structure, the B form structure of double-stranded double DNA. All right, thank you. <laughs>